Thank you all for coming. I am Alice Pang, the president of the Diamond Undergraduate Journal of Science, or do this for short. <coughs> and this is Andy Zurich, the editor-in-chief. So a little bit about the journal. We are, the, I have to say, the best science journal on campus. Of course, we're the only journal too, but that's the same. We have online, um, an online website at judas.dharmas.edu where you can find the latest science news uh, on campus. And we also have quarterly print issues. Where, uh, and the most recent issue is right outside the door when you came in. The fall issue theme and the theme for today is Mythbusters in honor of the Discovery Channel's show. Who says scientists can't have fun? So there are a lot of myths out there, and oftentimes <coughs> only science can answer them. So I hope today you will be able to find this event both enjoyable and informative. Forget the finals. Get excited about what's to come. Our first speaker today is Professor Sloboda of Biology at Dartmouth. He earned his Bachelor of Science at the State University of New York at Albany and his PhD at Ronseller Polytechnic <coughs> Institute. He has published in distinguished journals, including the Journal of Cell Biology, and his expertise is in cell biology and biochemistry. If you have any questions in these areas, Professor Sloboda is the one you want to talk to. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Professor Sloboda. So thanks, Alice, for that overly kind introduction. And I noticed that there's no pre-meds in the audience because the front row is empty. So I hope you're all still interested. But. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to tell you about uh, our work at, in, in uh, studying uh, cell structure and assemblies that happen inside cells, something we've been studying for a number of years. And what I'm going to tell you about is a structure called uh, cilium flagella that are not unlike Baker li Library Tower. If you think about Baker Library Tower when it was built, they started off here and they built these bricks and they added wood and everything. And so as the th library tower grew in length, all the assembly occurred at the growing tip. So keep that in mind as we go through the slide. I'm going to tell you about what we do in sort of general terms just to give you a feel the, for the way the research that we've been doing in the past 10 years has changed and went in unexpected directions. And then I'll tell a little bit about a myth towards the end and then I'll tell you why you should all be thankful that you're sitting here with normal cilia and flagella because it's very important for human health and disease. So it's brighter over here, I don't know why. So the, the, um, you might want, I'll look here, but you can watch over here as well. I'll point here sometimes. So we work on a, on a single-celled organism called bi, uh, Chlamydomonas. It's a biflagellate having two flagella, green alga, not shown here, but a big cup-shaped chloroplast. So it's a green plant, and it's uh, one of the first and early, early plants to evolve on the planet, and progenitors of this made multicellular colonies, and it's thought that that's how multicellular life arose eventually in the planet, one of the, one of the hypotheses. So we grow it in the lab normally on, in liquid culture, many copies of the single cell in, in culture, and we keep um, stocks growing on, on agar plates in, the, in, a, in an incubator, and we can grow these cells in either small quantities here in 250 milliliter flask in the green color because it's a green plant, or we can grow them in two liter flasks or eight liter jugs, depending if we want a lot of cells or a few cells, depending on what kind of experiment we're doing. We're doing biochemistry experiments, so we usually grow the cells in big jugs like this. Another person in the bio department who also works on the same organism is Elizabeth Smith, if you heard that name. She teaches, she's teaching cell biology this term. So what do we do? Well, we're interested in a structure inside cells called microtubules, as the name implies, little tubes. And they, they assemble from identical subunit building blocks of protein, and they make these long um, rod-shaped structures in the cell, and they 
contribute to the generation of asymmetric cell shape. As they grow, appendages stick out of a single cell. And if it's a flagellum that's being grown, then they, then they line the central part of the flagellum. But in this example, we're just showing a generic cell with microtubules growing, but the, the ultimate in microtubule-based asymmetric cell shape is the nerve cell with a long axon full of microtubules, a cell body here where the, and the nucleus where the, gene, where the genetic material uh, uh, resides, all the synthetic capacity making proteins, et cetera, reside in the cell body, but all the action happens down here at the synapse because the synapse is either in, in, interacting with another nerve cell in the central nervous system or a, or a muscle cell causing it to contract and stuff. So a transport process has evolved to get the material from the cell body down to the synapse. And this can be a huge length of, in a certain cells in the small of your back and your spine. The cell body is in your spine and the axon runs down and innervates a, 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 a muscle in your foot. So in a six foot tall human being, the axon can be about a meter in length. So it's an extreme example of an asymmetric cell shape. Hard to work on, difficult to dissect out of cells, and so we don't work on nerve cells anymore. We used to, but about eight years ago I did a sabbatical at Yale and I learned to work with chlamydomonas. So I'm going to explain to you why that's an, an interesting system to, in order to study this kind of transport process, which we don't do anymore because of the way that the research took a, the changes in directions, but I'll tell you about that. So here's chlamydomonas with its two flagella, and if you re superimpose those slides, it's not unlike a nerve axon. All the material, all the synthetic material in the DNA resides down here in the cell body of the chlamydomonas, and all the material, the tips of the, of the um, flagella grow out here. So when, these, when this cell grows two flagella, this, the growth starts here, and just like Baker Library Tower, I should have put Baker Library Tower down here, just like as Baker Library Tower grows out when it was being assembled, all the assembly that's required to, all the protein addition that's required to make these flagella happens out at the growing tip. So the tip is really interesting. We got in, interested in this problem by trying to understand what's happening at the growing tip of the, of the flagella, because this is where all the business ends. This is where the assembly occurs. This is where disassembly of the organelle occurs. So here's two um, video images that hopefully they'll play. And the one on the left is a light microscope image of a single chlamydomonas flagella. So the cell body is up there on the second floor somewhere. Another flagella is going off at some other angle. So we're looking at one chlamydomonas flagella. And what I hope you can see in this slide, or in this figure, is particles moving both directions along that flagellum. Can you see the movement? Is it clear? Yeah. So this is a process called intraflagellar transport, and it's analogous to the transport of the synaptic vesicles and things that are moving in nerve axons from the cell body down to the synapse. So this is, on the right, a single protein in the flagellum has been fluorescently labeled. So now we're using fluorescence microscopy, and what you're looking at here is a flagellum from one chlamydomonas down here with its other flagella out of the field of view, and another flagellum from a chlamydomonas over here with another flagellum out of the field of view. And so now we're looking at a single protein because it's labeled with a fluorescent tag. Again, I hope you can see that it stopped. Oh, well, did you see it was really quick? I don't know if it'll play again or not. Let me see if I can back up. There we go. Oh, well, by the time I get over here, it stops. So those little particles are packages of proteins called intraflagellar transport particles. And they're, they're analogous to flatbed trucks. When the new life science centers were being built, bricks and cement blocks and things were put on trucks and, and carted down the streets of Hanover and emptied off and assembled at the, at the construction site of the life science center. Well, these little flatbed trucks that you see moving as particles inside the flagellum are bringing materials out to grow and maintain the length of the flagellum and make it get longer. And then those trucks turn around and they go back to the cell body empty to get filled up with new material and brought back out again. So we're trying to understand the process. And the reason we're trying to understand the process is because when this happens, you know, here's a flagellum, here's an axon for comparison. When this happens, particles move out <coughs> continuously without stopping till they get to the tip. They stop there, unload their cargo, which is the raw materials for the growth of the flagellum, and then they come back empty to the cell body to get refilled and started over again. So we're interested in what we call the flagellar tip complex because a lot of action is happening out there. 
The, the, motors are, the, the, the motors driving this movement are getting turned on and off. Car, cargo is getting unloaded. Things are getting assembled. So there's a lot of key proteins that have presumably occur out here at the tip and nowhere else in the flagellum. So we're trying to understand, we started off the project by trying to understand what the composition of that tip was, okay? So one of the proteins, just to show you how, how it's done, one of the proteins we identified is a protein called EB1. So CR is for chlamydomonas EB1. And what I hope you can see over here is what we're looking at in this figure is a fluorescence microscopy that's being used to localize the presence of a single protein in these cells. And so green is identifying tubulin, which is the subunit protein of microtubules. So the flagella are all green because they're full of microtubules. Okay. And these are full-length flagella. These are cells that are regenerating their flagella, and these are cells that are resorbing their flagella. You can change the media conditions, and these things will shrink down and grow back out again. Okay. So here's the EB1, a little red dot there and there at the tip of those flagella. When you superimpose the two images, you can see the little red dot at the tip. So this is a protein that's specific for the flagellar tip. Kind of interesting, something we want, we're like totally amazed to see. And it's present at the tips in regenerating flagella. Here's the tips, here's EB1 in the overlaid image. And it's present in, at the tips of resorbing flagella. So it's a constant resident of the flagellar tip, nowhere else in the flagella. <coughs> Still don't know what it's doing there, but at least we've identified one protein. We set out to identify proteins at the tip. So we're try we're, we've identified this protein, and now we're trying to understand what it does. So there are about 600 different polypeptides in a single flagellum. So this is just one of them. So we wanted to see if we can find more to kind of get a catalog of what proteins are specific for the flagellar tip. And this is where the research took a completely unexpected and uh, unanticipated direction. So what, would this, what I'm showing you here is a diagram of a method called difference gel electrophoresis. And in this procedure, what you do is take, th in this example, take three different samples and, and make one sample, make the protein in one sample uh, fluorescently labeled with yellow dye, one labeled, another sample labeled with red, and another sa sample labeled with blue. Mix the three together and then ask a computer, separate the proteins and then ask a computer to tell you what the relative differences are in the levels of all the proteins based on their various intensities of redness, blueness, or yellowness. This is a, an important technique in studying cancerous cells compared to normal cells because you mix the two cell types and then ask the question, which cells have more of this protein than this protein. Which, which proteins are increased or decreased in the cancer cells relative to the wild types, normal cells? And that gives you some idea of what's gone aberrant and what's gone wrong under, in, under cancer cell growth. So we use this procedure to can now compare two samples. There's a diagram of it. The little green smiley face is the chloroplast of the chlamydomonas. The blue is the, DNA, is the nucleus. And the little skinny lines are the flagella. So we take flage uh, chlamydomonas flagella and we remove the flagella from the chlamydomonas and now we have a sample we call long flagella and we label them with an orange color. Then we let these cells start to regrow their flagella but before they get to be full length, when well, they're only about a third the length of these, we knock the flagella off again and we label those short flagella with a red dye. Okay? Now we got a red sample of short flagella and a yellow orange sample of long flagella. Now we compare an identical amount of flagella based on their length. So here's the long flagella, here's the short flagella. And what I hope you realize from this little diagram is that if there, are, if there are proteins specific to the tip, they should be represented at a higher proportional concentration in the short flagella sample than in the long flagella sample. Compare the two, the computer compares the two intensities of the two colors from the two different labeled samples and tells us which proteins are more intensely red versus ye yellow or orange in the two different samples. And what those, and on the gel there, on the analysis, it's called a gel, spots that show an increase in intensity of, of, of Psi 5 relative to Psi 3 are, are potential flagella tip complex proteins because they're represented in a higher proportion in the sample from the short flagella than they are from the sample from the long flagella. So one of the proteins we identified this way, and again, it's a little complex slide, but I'll walk you through it, is an enzyme called methionine synthesis, or METE, an enzyme that in plants is this enzyme right here, enzyme number three, called METE. It takes a molecule called homocysteine, and it makes a molecule called methionine. What is methionine from bio-8? 
It's an amino acid. Excellent. So methionine is an amino acid. What on earth is an amino acid doing in a flagellum where there is no, I just told you, there's no protein synthesis. My, my, uh, amino acids make proteins. So what on earth is methionine doing? And here's where the, the research takes a, an unexpected turn. What's methionine doing in, in, in the flagellum? And why is it increased at the flagellar tip? Well, methionine works in a biochemical pathway in which homocysteine is converted to methionine, and then methionine is converted to a molecule called s methionine, which is a donor molecule for the methylation of proteins. So when protein-protein interactions are being disrupted, proteins often get methylated. When you take apart a psyllium or flagellum, you want to disrupt protein-protein interactions. So the hypothesis is that methylation is important in, um, in taking apart the flagellum when it resorbs. So PRMTs are, the are, are, are enzymes called protein arginyl methyl transferases, and these are enzymes that pointer's stopping to work. These are enzymes that add methyl groups to specific target proteins. And so what's happening in the flagellum is that the research here, this the different direction, is it revealed an unexpected pathway operating in the flagellum that nobody, and we had no idea was even in existence in the flagellum. So that's what we're studying now is protein methylation. We started to look at what proteins in the flagellar tip. Now we're trying to understand what protein methylation has as to do with as far as the dynamics of assembly and disassembly of the flagellum is concerned. What's this all got to do with the myth resounding my research data? Well, there is no myth because uh, it's a new f area, a new field just discovered. Had people haven't time to tell me I'm crazy yet. So we've only discovered this in the last few years. And so we don't really have a myth surrounding this particular research, but there's a huge major myth surrounding the study of psyllium and flagella in general. So, and that myth was in existence for about a century and it was dispelled about 10 years ago. So it led me to, to uh, organize this book here called Primary Psyllium. I think, I think they've sold about 12 copies nationwide. It's a really popular book. And so what you're looking at here on the cover is a scientist named Zimmerman who worked in Germany about 100 years ago. And he, as many microscopists of his time, had extremely terrific powers of observation. And he reported and published, and he and others published, that cells have a structure that he termed the central rod, now called the primary cilium. So it's a ciliary, it's a, it's a cilium that sticks off from the cell like a little antenna. Cilia and flagella are the same, are two different terms for the same structures. Cilia move cells through a liquid medium where they move fluid over stationary cells like in our airway and in the fallopian tubes of women. And flagella move sperm and chlamydomonas through a liquid medium. They're identical structures. If you if I showed you a cross section between the two of them, you'll be able to tell one, one from the other. They're, they're, they're completely identical. And in fact, all the proteins that exist in that chlamydomonas flagellum exist in the cilium flagella of, of the human body. It's a remarkable conservation of form and function and, and, and proteins over evolutionary time. So he hypothesized 100 years ago that this primary cilium was a little antenna that sensed the environment and sent signals down to the nucleus. And this is one of his drawings from this little ancient little microscope here. You can see a similar kind of microscope on display in the second floor of one of the display cases in the Life Science Center. So here's chlamydomonas with its two flagella. Here's a primary cilium with its flagella. Every cell in your body, if we discount the fallopian tube uh, ciliate epithelium and the airway uh, cilia of the trachea, Every cell in your body, except those of the blood system, white blood cells, red blood cells, et cetera, have a primary cilium. When I went to school, and when I went to graduate school, the primary cilium was taught as a, being a vestigial organelle, left over from the time when organisms that are multicellular now were free living and single celled like chlamydomonas, and as those cells group together and learn how to live in complex interactions and eventually become multicellular organisms, they, they retained the uh, primary cilia and evolution hadn't, hadn't caused it to be lost yet. So these primary cilia, unlike these flagella, these primary cilia are non-motile. So it was thought to be a vestigial organelle, yet 100 years ago, 
Zimmerman postulated that was like a little cellular antenna. And in fact, he was correct. And about 10 years ago, it was discovered in a rapid series of publications by a bunch of people that this little primary cilium on the cells of the brain, the eye, various organs in the cell body, et cetera, senses the environment, sends cues to the nucleus of the cells of which it's a part, and tells those cells to do different biological things. And so a host of human diseases now track to defects in this primary cilia. One example, if you haven't got a primary cilium on the kidney cells of your kidneys, you, have, you will get what's called polycystic kidney disease. It affects one in 650 people in North America. It's the major genetic defect causing a human disease in the human population. And what happens is if, you, if those cells don't have a primary cilia, or if the cells make a primary cilia, but it's in some way defective, when this fluid is flowing through the kidney, normally that cilium bends and tells the nucleus that fluid is flowing. If the cilium doesn't bend, a signal is not transduced to the nucleus, the nucleus says, uh-oh, I've got to divide and make more cells, and it divides. And over a lifetime, the cells of the kidney divide and divide and divide, and eventually they make these fluid-filled cysts because they don't stop dividing because they can't sense the proper fluid flow because they don't have proper functioning of their primary cilium. And so if you make a fist, that's about the size of one of your kidneys. If you have polycystic kidney disease, the kidney is, gets to be four or five times the size of your fist. And after you, when you reach about age 45, eventually the loop of Henle and stuff stopped filtering the urine and you get polycystic kidney disease and you have to go to, kid, to have kidney dialysis or have a kidney transplant. So that's just one of many major, major um, problems with uh, human physiology that result from defects in this primary cilium. So the myth is that this was a vestigial organelle and, uh, and, but then 100 years later, people reinvented or rediscovered the fact that it's a little antenna and it senses the cell's environment and tells the nucleus what to do. And if you don't do it, you have, for some strange reason, not yet completely understood, if you don't have a primary cilia in the cells of your hand, you get six digits instead of five. So that's just what, what we've been doing. Here's a little cartoon of intravenous transport in the upper right-hand corner. And, uh, some of, just some folks in the lab, Mark Schneider was a postdoc, Jessica Day, a grad student. Ben and Mike are two uh, 12s. They're graduating this year. They worked in the lab for a couple of years. Megan and Rita are lab technicians, and Louisa Howe is the EM technician who helped us with some of the EM that I didn't show you, and support came from the NSF and the NIH. Thanks for your attention. including the Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience. She is also trained in hypnosis, which today you'll be able to experience. Please join me in welcoming Professor Wheatley. Oh, thank you. Okay. Well, this is kind of cool. You get everything from um, the cellular level up to consciousness in one one fell swoop. Um, this always mystifies me. Okay, we'll just, I may have to just hold this thing. No, maybe not. Okay, let me just take the clicker. So um, hypnosis, I don't have to travel too far to um, find a myth about hypnosis because if you just Google hypnosis or hypnotist, you get these kinds of images, right? They're typically you know, middle-aged white guys with thyroidic eyes. They're always doing something crazy with their hands. 
They have crazy monikers like Mr. Hypnotist or uh, Hypnotize, or um, they use props, so like these guys. Uh, this guy's using a watch, it's pretty typical. This guy calls himself the Hip Hypnotist, which I don't even understand um, how he could possibly coin that for himself. But it's just, I feel like uh, any talk about hypnosis, I've got to wear a cape and a handlebar mustache and you know, start moving my hands around. Um, there's, this is uh, one reason why science hasn't really touched hypnosis with a 10-foot pole for you know, 100, 200 years. Um, because it's been in this domain of stage shows and black magic and craziness um, when it's actually none of that. I mean, if, of course you can go to a stage show, but that doesn't mean that it's not the product of some actual physical basis in the brain that's actually interesting and you can study it scientifically. Has anybody done hypnosis before? Anyone want to admit to trying it? No one? Seriously? Yes. Okay, one person. Did you do a stage show? Yeah, it was during orientation. Okay. Were you actually on stage? Yeah. Okay. All right. I don't do a stage show. I mean, I'm governed by IRBs and here the uh, Committee for the Protection of Human Subjects, so I don't, <laughs> I can't sort of do crazy things uh, without maybe getting into legal trouble. So I'm just going to do some standard stuff, but that's enough. Um, to show you that hypnosis is real. So the first thing I want to do, though, is I'm going to just give you a couple of findings that I like um, in, the, in the relatively recent literature um, that show that there's something real going on here. And then we'll do a little bit of a demo, and then we'll talk about it, OK? So is hypnosis real? Here's a couple of findings. And there are, there are many others um, in the literature. Um, the, the sort of the one thing that really gave um, validation to hypnosis as something to study scientifically was the advent of neuroimaging. So I do neuroimaging with um, fMRI at Moore Hall. I do uh, EEG, which is electrodes on the scalp, and other kinds of imaging. Um, once imaging sort of got involved and said, look, here it is in the brain, then sort of people started to think, oh, maybe this is something real, um, for, for better or worse. So I'm going to give you, I'm going to start here with, this is Steve. Is this working? No. OK. Maybe, yeah. OK, the guy with the beard is Steve Coslin. He's a professor at uh, uh, Harvard. And he did this study, um, which was sort of the first one to kind of set the field um, on fire with this idea that, OK, well, maybe we can study hypnosis for real. Uh, he did something very, very simple, really. He just showed people grid patterns, like sort of like Piet Mondrian grids in a way. Um, and they were either color or they were grayscale. OK, very simple. And he showed them to people while they uh, lay in a brain scanner. So I don't know if any of you have done MRI, but you're lying sort of supine in this little tube. And we take pictures of your brain while you're in there. And in particular, we take pictures of um, sort of your blood flow, uh, where, it's, where it's going in terms of uh, the oxygen levels. So what he wanted to know, first of all, was when you, when you put someone in a, in a scanner, um, what parts of the brain like color more than grayscale? And this has been done many, many times, actually. He wasn't the first person to do this, but this is where he started. And he finds that, um, now this may be kind of hard to see, but this is a slice of the brain. I'll go over here where it's brighter. Um, this, in case you aren't familiar with brain slices, um, this, is the, this is the spine, so spinal cord. So what I, what, what's happened here is, uh, so imagine someone's taken um, a knife and just cut through my scalp this way and peered in. And, and you see the middle, there's the spinal cord. So it's like sliced the whole top part of my head off. This is what you see. This is where the eyes would be, ear, ear. And you're just looking at the bottom part of the brain. And what you see are these regions in, in red that really like color more than things in grayscale. We, We've known about these areas for, for a while. This wasn't new. What he wanted to do next was uh, have highly hypnotizable subjects in the brain scanner while they looked at grayscale images and tell them to see color. OK? Now, I want you to try that. Make yourself see that gray uh, image in color, OK? 
difficult, right? It actually is impossible. You can't do it. You can try to sort of imagine that it's in color, but really you can't sort of trick yourself to seeing that really in color. It's, it, it's grayscale. But he wanted to see um, in hypnosis, can you sort of make people perceive color? And why do it in a brain scanner? Because nobody would, would really believe that people are really seeing it in color if you just ask them. So you hypnotize someone, say, do you see it in color? And they say, yes. How do you know they're not just telling you what you want to hear? How do you know that they're really seeing it in color? So you go to, a, to a, um, a brain scanner because we have identified the regions that are involved in the perception of color, not in the reporting of color, but the perception of color. And we see, can you modulate those regions? OK. And the other question to ask is, uh, I've got this. If, if you actually give people the thing in color, um, tell them, see it in grayscale, can they do it? So, and this area way in the back of the brain, so this is actually way back here. This part of the brain, this, this area is, is the most interesting one because it is so far back in visual cortex, so, so primitive in visual cortex, that that really is, um, you, don't, you can't modulate that by imagery, you can only modulate that by perception. Okay. So, um, this slide just tells you what the results are when you show someone a color square, and you say, see it in color. They activate this area more than if you're given them a grayscale image and say, see it in grayscale. Okay, that's the standard result everybody's found before. This region really likes color. Okay, that's not so interesting. What's more interesting is this, okay? This, these results, so this is just the same thing replicated. I just wanna show you, this is the, the standard response in this region to a grayscale image. Now, uh, this is the same grayscale image, but they're told under hypnosis to see it in color. This is highly hypnotizable people. And what you get is a boost in activation in this color perception region um, to the level that you would expect if, in fact, they were actually seeing color. And here's the, uh, the symmetrical result. On the other side, this is just what this region likes to do when it sees color vertically. And this is when uh, you're, they're told color uh, to see, um, they're, they're, sorry, they're given something in color and they're told, but see it as if it was grayscale. And you drain the activity out of this region um, just as you would expect if they were actually perceiving grayscale. So this was the first study really that kind of solidified hypnosis as maybe a valuable tool of getting at something um, real in the brain, not just acting, not just reporting, but per perception. Okay, the second finding I want to tell you about um, uses the, one of the most famous tasks in psychological science, which is the Stroop effect. Does anybody know what the Stroop task is here? A couple of you. Okay, well, well, let's do it together. It's a very, a very simple effect. Um, this guy f figured it out in 1935. Okay, let's read these together. What I want you to do, the Stroop, the Stroop task is that you, ha you have to say out loud the ink color that the word is written in. Not the word, the ink color, okay? So let's, re let's read the ink colors together, okay? Starting, starting with us, ready? Red, blue, orange. Okay, right, you, it, that's it, that's it. You immediately see the, the problem, right? It's difficult to say blue, difficult to say green, excuse me, <laughs> when this spells out a, a different color, right? You're told to, to just report the ink colors, but it's written a different word, and so the semantic interference causes you to slow down and make errors. Okay, that's the classic Stroop effect, okay. This is, these are just errors on incongruent trials. Incongruent trials are when the ink color doesn't match the um, label uh, of the color. Um, and what you see is that people make errors. This is errors on incongruent trials relative to congruent trials, and people make more errors. Um, and this is true, uh, sorry, the, um, the green and blue are, are different levels of hypnosis, uh, hypnotizability, but this is in the absence of hypnosis. Everybody's the same. Everybody makes errors on this task in those places. This is what happens when you've been hypnotized to not be able to read English. 
Okay, you're doing the task, but you're not reading words anymore. What you find is that with, with people who are not hypnotizable, same errors. Okay, because the suggestion doesn't work. Don't read English anymore. Okay, guys, I want you not to read that word. Okay, don't read it. Just look at it as if it's jumbled letters and don't read it. Can't do it. But with hypnosis, you can if you're highly hypnotizable. If you're a highly hypnotizable person, I can tell you, um, you, know, you no longer can read English, looks like scrambled letters. And what happens is they make no errors because they're just reading the ink colors. Imagine if you were reading those words and they were written in Spanish and you don't know Spanish or something. It'd be a pretty easy task, right? Because azul doesn't mean anything to you, so you just read whatever the ink color is. Um, so this is what happens with hypnosis. I actually did this experiment myself um, with a Harvard student when, uh, so I did part of my graduate training at Harvard and I was doing, using hypnosis at the time for my dissertation because I was interested in volitional action. Um, and I had this sort of virtuoso hypnotizable subject, this Harvard student. And I was sort of mucking around in graduate school one day with them, and I, had, I knew I had an hour with this guy. I didn't really have anything more I wanted him to do. So this is actually a few years before this came out. Um, these, were, these came out by different, different groups. Uh, I thought, you know, I'm just going to hypnotize him to not be able to read English. Never heard of anybody doing it before, and I thought, this is something he wouldn't be able to do, because if, if I know how the brain works, how could it be possible that you could hypnotize someone to not be able to read English? Surely you would have to be able to read the word, then somehow scramble it in your mind because, oh no, you're not supposed to read it. And, and it just wouldn't work. It didn't make any sense that it would work, right? If I, if I wrote the, the word red, R-E-D, and just told you not to read it, you just can't. It's a prepotent process. You're going to read the word red. So how could I possibly take that away by just suggesting that he can't read. It just didn't make any sense to me. So what I did was I thought, well, I'm just going to try it anyway, just, just prove myself that there are limits with this technique, and sat him down and hypnotized him. I said, uh, Sean, you're just not going to be able to read English anymore. It's not going to freak you out. It's not going to worry you. It's just going to look like scrambled letters, like a foreign language. You're just going to see these letters, and they're not going to make any sense to you, and that's OK. Um, and I woke him up. And I sat him in front of the Stroop task on the computer. Right? The Stroop task is important because nobody's been able to figure, a way, uh, figure out a way to fake it. Okay, Because um, you're going as fast as you can, and you make the traditional interference errors. You slow down. Sat him in front of the, the Stroop task and had him go through it. And what I expected to see was that he would make exactly the same errors as everybody else. And he didn't. He just flew through the whole thing, no errors. So then I started to freak out. And then I was like, oh, this was a Harvard student. What have I done? I'm going to get kicked out of graduate school. Um, parents are going to be calling deans. This is bad. So, um, so then I made him do it a second time because I just didn't believe it. And again, the computer spits out the, the results. And uh, I said, OK, Sean, we're, and I, I tried a few other things. And it, was, it convinced me that this guy really isn't reading. And I put him back in the chair, and I, I hypnotized him like, you could read English again, as if you know, I was you know, like, uh, is this going to work? I don't know. And then I woke him up, put him back in front of the Stroop task, and this time, boom. All the places where he was supposed to slow down and make errors, he did. And I said, and I didn't know exactly how to ask the question. I just said, uh, Sean, uh, what do you think of that program? And he said, well, obviously it's easier when they aren't real words. So it was the same program, right, both times. Um, that would sort of freaked me out. It freaked him out when I debriefed him and he wouldn't let me test him again, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> and I never did it again. It, was, it completely freaked me out. And then, and then um, a few years ago, um, a colleague of mine redid, redid the study with actually more subjects and found the same thing. Um, so I certainly believe this. But this, these sorts of paradigms uh, have been done now to show that, yes, hypnosis is real. This, and this came out um, a couple of years ago, this big ticks paper, Trends in Cognitive Sciences, to say, hey, guys, we should be using this as a tool. Um, this, the, 
we can learn so much um, about how the brain works by um, doing different kind of manipulations, almost like virtual lesions, and try to figure out uh, where things are happening in the brain. It says, the growing acceptance of consciousness as a legitimate field of inquiry and the availability of functional imaging has rekindled research interest in the use of hypnosis and the suggestion to manipulate subjective experience and gain insights into healthy um, and pathological brains. Okay. So i just give you a couple of examples. There are many more on, on pain and analgesia and memory that suggest there's something real going on here. There's a physical basis, not some metaphysical stage show acting weirdness. There's something real here um, to, to, to understand better and, and to figure out what's going on. And people are just now uh, trying it. So I thought we would do a quick demo, if you're up for it, where I just kind of show you what hypnosis, what it's like. Um, nothing weird. Hypnosis is just, at its core, deep relaxation. That's it. But in that state of deep relaxation, some people can can sort of enter this, what I'd call an altered state of consciousness, which allows you um, to do certain things with your brain that you might not otherwise be able to do. Um, uh, but, it, but essentially, it's just deep relaxation. It's nothing very weird. And I'm just going to be talking to you, and you're just going to stay in your seats, and nobody's going to be looking at you. So if you're interested, uh, we'll, we'll do a little demo, OK? And you don't have to, look, I can't hypnotize you if you're not willing. So if you don't want to be hypnotized, just don't do it. OK, the, um, the only way to, to see if you're hypnotizable is to be open to the experience, to kind of shut off the narrative uh, of overthinking and just kind of go with it. All right, and the one thing that we really know about what makes someone hypnotizable is the ability to concentrate your attention. So the degree to which you can sort of focus your attention on something and shut out everything else, that, that is a good thing for hypnosis. So maybe there's some meditators in the audience. Um, maybe you're the kind of person who will watch a, a movie and somebody will be calling your name and you don't even realize that they're calling your name because you're just kind of absorbed. That's a good sign that you're hypnotizable. Okay. Is this all right? We can do this? Okay. Um, can we dim the lights a little bit? If not, that's okay. Can we be closer? Um, as long as you can hear me, you're fine. You can, if you want to be a bit closer, you can. Okay. Oh, that's fine. That's great. So, um, I'd say probably about half of you will have kind of an interesting experience. Nothing, nothing strange, but it'll be interesting. Um, just kind of go with it and see what happens, all right? You're not going to get out of your chair. Nothing's going to happen that's too weird. I'm not going to be asking you for personal information. It's not embarrassing or silly or anything. But I will ask you to turn up your cell phones if you have them with you. I think mine's off. If they'll make a sound, so if they'll buzz and it'll hit something that'll make a sound, that would be bad. But if it's only going to be, I'm only going to do a 15 minute thing. Just enough for you to get a sense of whether or not you're hypnotizable, okay? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something that dates back to 1962 um, called the Harvard Scale, which actually was written by a bunch of people at Stanford, so I have no idea why it's called the Harvard Scale. But uh, it's, a, it's a classic. <coughs> Don't know. I think they're just leaving, leaving, not coming back, which is fine. Away. Okay. The way I'm going to start is um, so I just got through telling you that, that it, it's important to be able to focus your attention. So the way um, I want you to start is by focusing your attention on something. And I'm, we're going to look at just look at one of your hands. So put your hands in your lap and look at one of your hands. And um, yeah, just make sure there's nothing bouncing on your lap or anything like that that could fall. That would be great. All right. Okay. And I want you to put your hands on your lap, but I want you to 
fixate on a point. So that could be a knuckle, a mole, a nail bed, a ring, anything. Just find one particular point, I'll call it the target, and I want you to focus all of your attention on that spot and look at it as steadily as you can. And maybe, could you close the doors? I just don't, I don't know what's gonna be happening in the hallway, but. Okay. All right, and as we get, as we get situated here, just keep looking at that spot. Look at it as steadily as you can. Should your eyes wander away from it, that'll be fine. Just bring them back to it and continue to look at it as steadily as you, as you can. Your ability to be hypnotized depends partly on your willingness to be hypnotized and partly on your ability to concentrate on that target. If you pay close attention to what I tell you and think of the things I tell you to think about, you'll find it easy to experience what it's like to be hypnotized. Some people report that it feels a bit like falling asleep, but with the difference that somehow or other you can clearly hear me. You will continue to hear me however deep a sleep you may feel yourself to be. In some ways, it may be akin to sleepwalking. All I ask is that you keep up your attention and interest and continue to cooperate. Nothing will be done that will cause you any embarrassment. Just keep looking at the target. And relax, don't be tense. Keep your eyes on the target. Look at it as steadily as you can. Should your eyes wander away from it, that'll be fine. Just bring them back to it, as I said before. If, they, if the target gets blurry or changes color or shape, that's fine. Just let happen whatever you find is happening, even if it's not what you expect. Keep staring at the target for a while, and there will come a time when your eyes will be so tired will feel so heavy that they will close, perhaps quite involuntarily. Whenever that happens, just let it take place. And as I continue to talk, you'll find that you'll become more and more drowsy, but not everyone responds at the same rate to what I have to say. Some of your eyes will close before others. When the time comes that your eyes have closed, just let them remain closed. You may find that I shall still give suggestions for your eyes to close. These suggestions will not bother you. They'll be for other people. Giving these suggestions to other people will not disturb you, but will simply allow you to relax more and more. You'll find that you can relax completely, but still sit up comfortably in your chair with little effort. You'll be able to shift your position as needed without it disturbing you. Now just allow yourself to relax completely. Relax every muscle of your body. Relax the muscles of your legs. Relax the muscles of your feet. Relax the muscles of your arms. Relax the muscles of your hands, of your fingers. Relax the muscles of your neck, of your chest. Relax all the muscles of your body and let yourself be limp, limp limp. Relax more and more, more and more. Relax completely, relax completely, relax completely. As you relax more and more, a feeling of heaviness becomes over your body. A feeling of heaviness is coming into your legs and your arms, into your feet and your hands, into your whole body. Your legs feel heavy and limp, heavy and limp. Your arms are heavy, heavy. Your whole body feels heavy, heavy and tired, heavier and heavier, like lead. Your eyelids feel especially heavy, heavy and tired, and you're beginning to feel drowsy, drowsy and sleepy. Your breathing is becoming slow and regular slow and regular. You're getting drowsy and sleepy, more and more drowsy and sleepy, while your eyelids become heavier and heavier, 
more and more tired and heavy. Your eyes are tired from staring. The heaviness in your eyelids is increasing. Soon you'll not be able to keep your eyes open. Soon your eyes will close of themselves. Your eyelids will be too heavy to keep open. Your eyes are tired from staring. Your eyes are becoming wet from straining. It will be so nice to close your eyes, to relax completely, to relax completely, to relax completely. Just listen sleepily to my voice talking to you. Relax completely. You would like to close your eyes. You'll soon reach your limit. The strain will be so great. Your eyes will be so tired. Your lids will become so heavy that your eyes will close of themselves. Close of themselves. Your eyelids are getting heavy, very heavy. You're relaxed, very relaxed. And there's a pleasant feeling of warmth and heaviness all through your body. You're tired and drowsy, tired and sleepy, sleepy, listening without effort to my voice. Pay attention to nothing else but my voice. Your eyes are getting blurred. You're having difficulty seeing. Your eyes are strained. The strain is getting greater and greater, greater and greater. Your lids are heavy, heavy as lead, getting heavier and heavier, heavier and heavier. They are pushing down, down. Your eyelids seem weighted, weighted with lead, heavy as lead. And your eyes are blinking, blinking, closing, closing. Your eyes may have closed by now, and if they have not, they would soon close of themselves, but there's no need to strain them more. Even if your eyes have not closed fully as yet, you've concentrated well upon the target and have become relaxed and drowsy. At this time, you may just let your eyes close. That's it, eyes completely closed. You are now comfortably relaxed, but you're going to relax even more, much more. Your eyes are now closed, and you will keep your eyes closed until I tell you otherwise or I tell you to awaken. You feel drowsy and sleepy. Just keep listening to my voice. Pay close attention to it. Keep your thoughts on what I'm saying and just listen. You're going to get much more drowsy and sleepy. Soon you'll be deep asleep, but you'll continue to hear me. You will always hear me no matter how deep asleep you feel yourself to be. You will not awaken until I tell you to do so. I shall now begin to count, and at each count, you'll feel yourself going down, down to a deep, restful sleep, a sleep in which you'll be able to do all sorts of things I ask you to do. One, you're going to go deeply asleep. Two, down, down into a deep, sound sleep. Three, four, more and more, more and more asleep. Five, six, seven, you're sinking, sinking into a deep, deep sleep. Nothing will disturb you. Pay attention only to my voice and only to such things as I may call to your attention. Eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, deeper and deeper. Always deeper asleep. 13, 14, 15. Although deep asleep, you can clearly hear me. 16, 17, 18. Deep asleep, fast asleep. Nothing will disturb you. You're going to experience many things that I will tell you to experience. 19, 20, deep asleep. You will not awaken until I tell you to do so. You will wish to sleep and will have the experiences I shall presently describe. And now that you're very relaxed and sleepy, it will not disturb you to make yourself comfortable in your chair and put your head in a comfortable position. You're very relaxed and sleepy, listening without effort to my voice. 
and I'm going to help you to learn more about how your thoughts affect your actions in this state. Not all people experience just the same things in this state, and perhaps you'll not have all the experiences I will describe to you. That'll be all right. But you will have at least some of these experiences and find them interesting. Just experience whatever you can. Pay close attention to what I tell you and watch what happens. Just let happen whatever you find is happening, even if it's not what you expect. And now I want you to hold both hands up in the air, straight out in front of you, palms facing inward. Palms facing toward each other. Hands out, that's right, straight out, up in the air. Palms facing toward each other. Hold your hands about a foot apart. That's right, hands out. Palms facing toward each other. About a foot apart. Now, I want you to imagine a force attracting your hands together, pulling them together. And as you think of this force pulling your hands together, they will move together slowly at first but they will move closer together, closer and closer together as though a force were acting on them, as if there were magnets in the palms of your hands. Closer, closer, closer. It's fine. You can now put your hands back in resting position and relax. Hands back in resting position and relax. And as your hands relax, allow your whole body to relax. And now let's try something else. Put your fingers together. Interlock your fingers together. That's right. Interlock your fingers and press your hands tightly together. That's right. Interlock tightly. Hands press tightly together. Tightly together. Notice how your fingers are becoming interlocked. Tightly interlocked together, more and more tightly interlocked together. So tightly interlocked together that you wonder very much if you could take your fingers and hands apart. They're interlocked, tightly interlocked, locked in place. And I want you to try to take your hands apart. Just try. Okay, that's fine. You can stop trying and relax. Your hands are no longer locked together. You can take them apart now. Take your hands apart now and put them back in resting position and relax. Hands back in resting position and relax. Just relax. And now, please extend your left arm straight out in front of you, up in the air, and make a fist. That's right, left arm straight out in front of you, up in the air. Make a fist. Make a tight fist. That's right, straight out. Make a tight fist. I want you to pay attention to this arm and imagine that it's becoming stiff. Stiffer and stiffer, very stiff. And now you notice that something is happening to your arm. You notice a feeling of stiffness coming into it. It is becoming stiff, more and more stiff, rigid, like a bar of iron. And you know how difficult, how impossible it is to bend a bar of iron like your arm. See how much your arm is like a bar of iron. Test how stiff and rigid it is. Try to bend it. Try. It's fine. You can stop trying and relax. Your arm is no longer stiff. You can put it back in resting position. And as your arm relaxes, allow your whole body to relax. Your arm is no longer stiff. You can put it back in resting position. And as your arm relaxes, allow your whole body to relax. You see again how thinking about a movement causes a tendency to make it. Your hands and arms are no longer stiff. And they are relaxed, very relaxed. Remain deeply relaxed and pay close attention to what I'm going to tell you next. In a moment, I shall begin counting backwards from 20 to 1. You'll gradually wake up, but for most of the count, you'll stay in this state. By the time I reach 5, you'll open your eyes, but you'll not be fully alert. When I get to 1, you'll be fully alert in your normal state of wakefulness without any headache or other after effects. 
After you open your eyes, you will be fine. I shall now count backwards from 20. Remember, at five, not sooner, you'll open your eyes, but you won't be fully alert until I say one. At one, you'll be awake, feeling refreshed, renewed, with no headache or other after effects. Ready? 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, halfway, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Wide awake. Allow yourself to wake up. That's it. That's all it is. Okay. Now, for some of you, because I had the bird's eye view, I could see that you had some interesting experiences that maybe you'd like to share, maybe not. You don't have to. Um, does anyone want to share that just at the beginning, right away at the beginning, there was some vi the weird visual effects? Did anybody have any weird visual effects? OK. What was going on? OK, your hand was blurring? Yeah, like the one that I was focusing on. Was kind of OK. Yes? Good. Anyone else? <coughs> Negative images, anything? A little bit, yeah. That actually isn't hypnosis. What that is, is um, <laughs> that just tells you you are excellent at visually attending, because what you're doing is fatiguing visual neurons. So you're attending so steadily, so hard, that you're actually fatiguing visual neurons and creating these sort of visual hallucinations. Um, but it is a good sign for being hypnotizable, because it is your ability to attend. Did, was anybody surprised of this field? Did anybody not know where their hands were in space when that happened? Or surprised? Yeah, Alice. Yeah, what? Did it happen for you? Well, they were together. I have no idea when they were in touch or if they were Right. Which is, re which is only something I've recently um, realized because somebody. I did this with a sorority a couple of weeks ago, and somebody said that. I didn't know. I was surprised where my hands were when they touched. That actually tells us something very interesting about um, how hypnosis is happening in the brain, that you're not actually, um, proprioception is being sort of disrupted. Um, and that gives us a clue as to what's happening, which is interesting. Um, anybody surprised by not being able to take their fingers apart or not being able to bend their arm? Which one? Yeah, uh, interlocking like, the fingers. <coughs> like, I was actually really surprised. Like, I couldn't tell, like, which was my will of, like, not taking them apart. And even, like, when they were at this point, like, they were still not letting go. Coming, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you were trying. Yeah. OK. Um, <coughs> did anyone feel like, well, I could do it if I wanted to, but I just didn't want to? Right, that sometimes <coughs> happens. Um, anybody have trouble with, with this? Yeah, what did that feel like? Did it feel like there wasn't a joint there? What happened? It was solid and my arm was shaking. Right, I saw that. You were really. It wasn't feeling it. Right. Um, all right, so I, we just got a big grant um, uh, in PBS. Uh, myself and a vision scientist, um, it's actually a a grant where a, a couple of philosophers in the philosophy department are also on it to look at the neural basis of free will, of volitional action. And we're actually doing hypnosis because what's interesting there is because you're doing all these behaviors, it's you, but it doesn't feel like you, right? It doesn't feel like you're somehow the author of your actions. So what that gives us is a window into conscious experience, because if you can turn it on and off, but it still have behavior, then maybe we can look and see, well, what's the difference in brain activity when you feel like the author of your action and when you don't? And so if I can just uh, show. This is actually a quote from a guy I hypnotized to, had to do a, it was actually a post-hypnotic suggestion, which I didn't do for you guys. But sometimes what I do with hypnosis is at the end, I, well, right before I wake someone up, I say, by the way, whenever you hear this cue or whenever you see this word written down, you will do this other behavior or you will experience this feeling or something like that. And you won't know why. Um, and you won't have any memory for me telling you this. And then I wake them up. 
and, in, and give them the cue, and they have the experience, they'll do the behavior, say whether it's walk over to a bookshelf and pick out a book and go to a certain page. I was like, why are you doing that? And they have no idea, right? Um, and this is all interesting to me because I, I in part study free will and consciousness. Um, this is what one guy wrote, uh, uh, sorry, said to me in a debriefing session that I wrote down. It was an awkward experience. I felt like there were different parts of me speaking at the same time. Different parts of me were analyzing the situation. I was like, I see this apple and this orange. The suggestion was to go pick up an apple and an orange. And one part of me was saying, pick it up. But there was another part of me questioning why. And then one part of me forced me to do it. And the other part still questioning why. Almost like two sides. I didn't feel too whole to tell you the truth. It's like the behavior and the suggestion was operating one level of consciousness and, and well, just under consciousness. And then there was this other layer of consciousness happening at the same time. And it felt, um, other people have described it to me as feeling schizophrenic for the first time. Or one person recently said to me, is this what mental illness feels like? Um, maybe, uh, right. I make sure they're whole when they leave the uh, experiment. But what people report feeling is a bit like being a puppet on a string. And maybe you kind of felt like this Maybe you felt like it was happening to you, or you were just sort of observing it, and it wasn't you doing it. Well, that's really interesting, because it makes us think that we might get a some purchase on what we call the hard problem, which is what is conscious experience? What is our subjective experience, the feeling of being a self all about? Where does that come from? How do our brains deliver that? And one hypothesis right now is that it's an emergent property of a lot of long-range axonal connections um, in the brain happening all, all at once, all connected, and is somehow, it's early days, but somehow this sort of emerges into this um, conscious experience of what's going on. And what happens with the hypnosis that we know is that these, we, you don't see so much of this um, large-scale connectivity in the brain during hypnosis. You see sort of localized activity and perhaps it doesn't reach the level of consciousness. But it does, it is enough to get people to do things, to behave, to, to um, do certain commands, not enough to feel like they're the authors of their own action. So hypnosis, not only is it real, it might give us a window that we've never had before on studying something like what does consciousness give us? What is that feeling of self all about? Where does it come from? Um, so that is, I think, that's all I have, but I just wanted to leave you with this, um, uh, that my myth was, uh, is hypnosis real? But more importantly than that, um, don't limit yourself to what you want to study in science. As, as long as it has some kind of physical basis, we know hypnosis now has a physical basis, then let's use it. Let's figure out what it is um, and what it can give us. And don't limit yourself to the tools you use. Don't limit yourself to the questions you ask, because science is bigger than that. Thank you. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, of course. So, assuming you had a soothing voice, yes. have you written that script out and have anybody read it and have the same effect in an audience? I think so. Um, I don't particularly think my voice is soothing. Oh, that's true. Oh. <laughs> 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 All right, then. Um, I actually, when I started, I was using a tape by my advisor. My advisor had, had spoken into a tape recorder, and I was using his tape because he had this sort of James Earl Jones sort of voice. And then the tape broke, and I had all these subjects. And I was like, oh, I'll, I'll do it, you know? And I thought, there's no way I'm going to be able to pull this off. I'm like five foot five, I'm female, I don't have a very strong voice. And it just worked. And I don't. I mean, maybe I have a good voice, but I really don't think that's, unless you have a very irritating voice. Like if Gilbert Godfrey, that Gilbert. Yeah, he might have a bit of a problem, <laughs> right. But uh, it's a lot of rhythmic, I think anybody can do it. As long as you pace yourself and do it slowly and it, there's a rhythm to it, as long as you get that, I think really almost anybody could do it. Yes? Let's say that we You know, I'm, I'm going to guess and say yes, but to be honest, I don't know. I don't, I don't have IRB approval to allow that, um, to just sort of let them go into the world and see what happens, right? I've got to actually wake them up. So I haven't been able to empirically test that. 
I sort of feel like something's got to take you out of it eventually, but we don't know. I will tell you that post-hypnotic suggestions by personal mistakes I have made seem to last around three days. Okay, and I'll tell you that because um, <laughs> I've, a couple of times I've embedded uh, a suggestion and then let people go, um, and they'll call me three days later and say, I still am doing this weird thing whenever I hear this other thing, and when is this gonna go away? One time I hypnotized pe uh, people. I was actually re-hypnotizing them to take away a suggestion. I thought, oh, I don't know, throw in anything you want. Let's, you know, if anybody wants to quit smoking, well, I might as well do that at the same time. So I took away, <laughs> so they, and they're all like, you know, they're like Dartmouth students, and then so they're, oh, we want to be able to study without sleeping, and all this kind of like, <laughs> is all about getting my, a good grade in my midterm not happiness or world peace or whatever. But so I take away the, the suggestion of that particular experiment, say you no longer will do this thing to the queue, um, and you know, you won't have to sleep, you can just stay up all night and study and you'll absorb the information and whatever. Let them go, thinking what's the cost to that. And then I got phone calls three days later. One, one woman actually said, I haven't slept in three days. I feel excellent. <laughs> I feel the best I've ever felt in my life. But in Psych 1, you know, the professor said that sleep is really important. And what happens to me if I never sleep again? You know? And it's like, I don't know, but uh, keep me apprised if, uh, you know, if that happens. And I never heard from her again, so <laughs> knock on wood. Uh, so, uh, three days seems to be around the maximum, um, but I haven't empirically tested that. That's just from my own mistakes. So it's at yeah. least three days. Right? It's at least three days, I should say, right. Lots more work to do. <laughs> yes. I've heard people say that you can't hypnotize people and make them do really terrible things and they would be otherwise. Is that, is that true? Like, again, I'm, I'm governed by RB, so I haven't been able to <laughs> test that. Well, one study, you know, back like in the 50s, there was a hypnosis study where they, they told people, here's a beaker of acid, throw it in the experimenter's face. And people did. And then there's sort of this outcry of, oh, look what hypnosis can make people do. And then savvy social psychologists came in and said, no, we'll just tell any undergraduate to do that. Um, no hypnosis. <laughs> Throw this beaker vast in the hypnosis in the in the experimenter space. Did it. So, <laughs> you know, people do what they're told. I'm not sure a hypnosis has anything to do with that. So, so the answer is it's unknown yet what the limits are of what you can get people to do if they have some kind of, you know, self control red flag comes in or not. Any other questions? Yes, in the back. Can you give two commands that like? Um go against each other, like, don't eat this, like, you're very hungry, or something like that. <laughs> That's so mean. <laughs> <laughs> they did that. They did that, yeah. yeah they did that. Who did that? The hypnotist at orientation. Oh, did it work? Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, you know more than I do. Um, <laughs> I no, just... it's, it's context of, like, the experiments that have been done in, like, what is... Hasn't been done, in, to my knowledge, in, um, like, it, there's no journal article associated with that kind of finding. But it's really, it's really interesting. It seems like a cruel thing to do, but it would be interesting. <laughs> yes? Have you find that your skill with hypnotizing people has improved over time? And if so, what, what sort of modifications have you had to choose on? Uh, I think I've just become more easy with what it is. And I've seen enough weird things that I know um, what I'm, I know what I'm doing now, and, what, and if something weird happens, I know how to solve it. But it's pretty much, I mean, you just heard me. It's just, it's just talking. It's just reading. Um, so I think uh, as long as you feel comfortable, I think that's a big part of it. But other than that, no, I haven't done much. I have hypnotized thousands of people, so I, I kind of understand how it works now. But yes? Has anyone gotten a seizure or something like that from hypnosis? Um, not actually with me, but yes. Um, it, so some people can have um, relaxation-induced seizures, uh, where if they, they're sort of, uh, they can be a little bit tightly wound, and when they relax too much, it kind of freaks them out, and 
and so any kind of relaxation induction, whether um, it's a straight meditation or more of a hypnosis, can, can create a seizure like that. Um, so that does, that can happen. Um, headaches can happen, pressure, uh, feeling pressure in the brain can happen, things like that. Is it, is it, was the hypnotist that came at Ori Fish named Tom DeLuca? Do you know? That does ring a bell. I know Marco the Magician sometimes does it. Um, do you know the name, Tom DeLuca? I do know the name. So. What the middle school is. Really? <laughs> Doesn't he go? He was a real. I think he was at UVA when he <laughs> Again, right? He's so like, at UVA every year. Though. Okay, he that's why I know the name. Went to UVA, yeah. Right. Yeah. There's a lot of nut jobs associated with hypnosis. I'm trying to change that. All right. Well, thank you very much.